Amen. Living for Jesus, man. It sure seems easy, doesn't it? But it is our goal to live for Jesus and live lives to please Him. Today we're starting a new series from zero to hero. If you put that first thing up there, I mean, I love what Melanie did with this because it looks like a superhero. Doesn't it look like Superman or something? But if we're honest, we've all dealt with the idea that we're not worth anything. We've all dealt with that, that idea. We feel like our life has not affected anyone else, and we never will. But sometimes we just have that honest. We think that heroes are different than we are. They have something special about them. Well, <laughs> in a manner of speaking, they do. Heroes in the Bible obey God. That's what they do. They obey God. They start with a humble background, and that's why God chooses them. They don't think that they're this mighty hero that we see at the end, in the beginning of their life. They understand that the only thing special about them is the God they follow. Let that sink in for a second. The only thing special about me is the God I follow. That He lives in me and He guides me. See, God can and wants to use anyone. And he's not going to use people who will try and take the credit for themselves. If we try and take the credit, he's probably not going to use us. Today we're talking about Gideon, like I said. He's an ordinary person. Just this run-of-mill guy. In fact, he has all kinds of excuses why God can't use him. But when he obeys, God does something amazing. When Gideon obeys. God overcomes Gideon's doubt to defeat an army that can't even be numbered. Now think about that. An army, you're about to fight an army that can't be numbered. And God does it with just a few men. Miracles happen when we obey, listen, humble ourselves, seek God's face, turn from our wicked ways. 2 Chronicles 7.14 So today we're starting in Judges chapter 6, verse 11. You got your Bible, Judges? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, chapter 6, verse 11 is where we're gonna, our text is going to start. Judges, chapter 6, verse 11. Number one on your outline, the introduction of Gideon. We're fixing to be introduced to Gideon. Okay? Let's find this amazing introduction to this hero, right? Look up to verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah, that pertaineth unto Joash the Abizarite, and his son Gideon, threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Here's our hero. He's hiding. We're introduced to him. The first thing we find out about him, he's hiding. Doesn't that sound like a superhero? Oh no, I've got to hide. The enemy might be near. It's amazing what happens because of the disobedience in chapter 6. Now remember Judges. The book of Judges goes this way. The children of Israel are blessings of God. They turn away from God. He punishes them. They are in subjection. He sends a judge to judge them. They turn back to God. He raises them back up. In chapter 6, uh, verse 1, it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian, for seven years. So they turned away from God. They're doing evil things. And God delivered them to the Midian. To the hands of the Midians. They've been destroying the Midians. Midianites have been destroying their crops. We're looking at verse 3 and 4. They've been, they've been terrorizing. And so it was when Israel had sown. <coughs> planted. When they had sown that the Midianites came up. And the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. They're destroying everything that's growing. And, and they, they plant a crop, and guess what? The Midianites come in and destroy it. And so the Israelites are in desperate need here. They are starving. They have very little. They can't feed their animals. They can't do anything. Every time they grow a crop, it's destroyed. So when we find Gideon, he's hiding from the Midianites. Verse 11 there, it says he is by a wine press. 
Now, I want you to understand what happened with the, 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 the things were they would take a stone normally and they would have the stone in a, in a rock or something and a, a ox or a mule would pull that around and they would put their, their weed or whatever in there and that stone would hit it and break it apart from the, from the uh, plant. And then they might either take it on a sheet, throw it up, and the bad stuff blow away, and the seeds would fall down. They did a couple different ways, but that's normally what they did, okay? But a wine press was a smaller area where they would put grapes in and make juice, right? It's not a big area. Then notice that he's not in the wine press, which would be a hard surface. Where is he? Look what it says. Gideon thresh wheat by the wine press. Listen, he doesn't even have enough wheat here to put it in this wine press and do it that way. He doesn't need an animal because he doesn't have enough wheat to use a stone. Our hero, the tidy, also has very little. This is not the usual place to thrice wheat, but he had to do it somewhere that they wouldn't look. Because everywhere that they would have a threshing floor, here would come the Midianites. So he's hiding. Not only is he hiding, he's alone. Right? He has no one with him. Now, we, he has many servants, according to Judges 6.27. You can look there. There's at least ten servants he talks about later, we'll see. But they're not with him. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it. from. He's there by himself. He doesn't have enough wheat to need help from servants to, to thresh it. Usually the father of the family is chosen to lead, but not here. Guess who's the one trying to, to thrash the wheat and do all this? It's the son. You know why? Now, we always think of heroes have to have a good heritage, right? No, his dad worships Baal, according to chapter 6, verse 25. He's by himself. He has very little, and his dad worships a false god. Now, this guy's a good hero. You know, I mean, he's got the, the pedigree. He's got everything we think to... No, he doesn't. He's hiding by himself with very little, and even his own family doesn't follow God. The word used here for thrashed wheat indicates he was using a stick or a rod. Instead of using an animal with a stone, he, he's got so little, he's got a stick. He's pounding this wheat with to break it off of the. Are you catching me? Our hero here? He had so little, he didn't need animals. He's alone. Our future hero is hiding alone and doesn't have much. Right? What about, think about the reality of the situation. The reality is Gideon is not, Gideon is not plotting his next move. He's not scouting the enemy. No? He's not looking, okay, we got to take these guys out. Here, everybody come together. Let's get a plan together to take these guys out because we can't do this. I don't have much. No, no, he's not doing that. He's hiding, trying to provide <coughs> as little he can. He's not attacking the weaknesses of the enemy or, or probing their defenses, walking along, spying it out like we would think a hero would do, wouldn't we? We'd think a hero would be like, okay, I'm taking matters in my own hands. I'm going to go find out the problem. I'm going to go find out how we can defeat this. No, he's hiding, just trying to get a little food for himself. Does this look like a hero to you? He's, he's not super strong. He, he's not super brave. He doesn't have much. He doesn't have a heritage of a godly person. The world will look at him and say, he's a zero. He's nothing. But number two, the commission of Gideon. Look at the commission of Gideon. This angel visits him in verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee. Now, I want, if you underline your Bible, this is like a joke in the Bible. Okay? He's hiding. He's, he's not doing anything. And this angel of the Lord appeared to him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thy mighty man of valor. You know, you hear that voiceover voice coming in. You mighty man of valor. And he's hiding going, Who's there? 
the angel of the Lord comes, and, and he comes to the exact place where he can find a humble person that will follow him. You see, the Bible says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak. Remember, begin verse 11? Which was an Ophrah that pertained to Joash. Out of, this wasn't an accident where this angel of the Lord came. Verse 11 tells us he came to the exact place, to the exact location, to the exact tree that, that came to the family of Joash. He was in this specific place looking for our future hero, the tiding not making plans, not doing much. Angels looking for, a, for Gideon, the specific person. See, God doesn't actually accidentally choose people. God doesn't have accidents. Everything God does is on purpose. And, and we see that because it says, and, the, and there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak. He chooses a specific oak tree to sit under. Where was the oak tree? By the wine press. He was going to the exact place that he knew Gideon would be. He sat on an oak tree, which is in Ophrah. He went to a specific region. That pertained unto Joash, to Abizrite, for a specific family. You see, when I read this beginning, I don't find a hero here. I find just an average person just trying to make it for another day with what he had. So who's this angel? Now, this is an important attribute, I believe, in this story. Because we find the angel of the Lord. What does Gideon, skip now, what does Gideon call him in verse 13? And Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord. Huh. Oh my Lord. What does he say in verse 14? And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of men. I, have I not sent thee? Well, wait, who sent Gideon? Now, remember, angels are messengers for God, right? They don't speak in the first person. They would say, God sent you. But what does this angel say? I sent you. That's weird. Look at verse 16. And the Lord said it. Oh, wait, now we have a different word for Lord even here. And look what it says. And the Lord said unto him, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah says to him. So what does the angel say in verse 16? And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one. Now, wait a minute. We find this angel of the Lord speaking the first person he's being addressed by the word Jehovah. Guess who this is? I personally believe this is Jesus in the Old Testament. And when you find the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, many times we find that it's God there and the person that comes to earth of the Trinity in fleshly form is who? Jesus, Jehovah, God. So we find God here. Now, if you notice in your outline when it says angel of the Lord, or angel, we're talking about this, guess what? We capitalize that on purpose. I believe it's God here, okay? And God is speaking to Gideon. Jesus is speaking to Gideon. And he commissions him. The angel finds him by himself with so little and calls him a mighty man of valor. <laughs> You know, and, and even the story, the rest of the story, you're going to see. If I was right, I would say that was wishful thinking. That's God's word, so we're not going to say that. But in my opinion, I mean, it's like, mighty man of valor. Man, if he's a mighty man of valor, he'd be out fighting. If he was a mighty man of valor, he'd be out uh, at least scouting the enemy, making a battle plan, gathering troops. Dude, that'd be a mighty man of valor, wouldn't it? But can I submit to you something? I want you to catch this with me this morning. It takes a mighty man or woman of valor to do what God says. A lot of times we want to see the heroes that do great things for God. But I'm telling you, the real heroes of the faith are some people who are just obedient to do God's will. And that means that sometimes it's people that pray and spend hours in prayer time. Because some of you guys have a gift to just spend time in prayer. And some of you guys have a gift to teach. 
And I believe that real heroes, mighty men of valor, obey God. And they don't do something super spectacular. They let God do that. They just do what God says. They're just humble, obedient, and give God the glory. And, and they follow him. You see, this mighty man of valor, we're talking about Gideon? The might doesn't come from Gideon. The might comes from the first statement that he says, the Lord is with thee. Look at it. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, verse 12 there, what, is, what does the angel say to him? The Lord's with thee. Therefore, he can call him a mighty man of valor because God's on the side. Let me tell you something. When God's doing something for you, when God's working through you, you can be a mighty man of valor despite what you do. The power doesn't come from Gideon. We don't see anything powerful about Gideon. The reason that Gideon is powerful, the reason he becomes a hero, is because God's with him. It's not about Gideon. It's about God. It's not about you. It's about God. It's about obeying God and doing his thing. He first tells him the Lord's with him. He then calls him the mighty man of valor. See, sometimes we skip over. We don't catch what he's saying. He said in him and said, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Wow. Our strength comes from the Lord, not our own. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us where who believe? according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in heavenly places. Wednesday night, we talked about the same power. There's a contemporary song. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, God gives to us. Listen, we are powerful. We are mighty through God, not through ourselves. We have the power that raised Jesus from the dead working in our lives. That's where our power comes from. That's where Gideon's power come from, came from. The same power is in us that raised Jesus from the dead. Our power and greatness does not come from ourselves. It comes from the God we serve. But Gideon's not convinced. <laughs> After the angel calls him a mighty man of valor, look in verse 13. And Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord. Look at that next little word after, oh, my Lord. What's that word? Is that like a real positive word? Like, okay, I'm ready to go. No, he says, if the Lord be with us, why then has all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us. Gideon do you understand who you're talking to here? The Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands. Of, he hadn't forsaken them, but he had delivered them in the hands of the Midianites, had he? He still wants, listen, when we turn away from God and, and, and we're out of relationship with God, he still wants to have a relationship with you, but you have to turn back to him. You catch me? Sometimes we feel like, well, God left me. God didn't leave. I messed up. You messed up. And the way to get God back in your life is to come back to Him. And that's what the children of Israel had to do. They had to come back to Him. But He has doubts. He says, God's not with us. If God was with us, where are the miracles? Where's all the things that should have happened? Do heroes doubt? Oh, no, no, no. Our heroes, they're confident. They're assured. They, they don't doubt. Uh, when you go from a zero to a hero, you do. And when we feel like zeros and we have doubts, God's still there. And he's still mighty and he's still powerful. Let me ask you a question, just honestly, in your mind. Which has doubts, heroes or zeros? Zeros have doubts. Heroes never doubt. So we finally get in here and doubt the way the world looks at him. He ends up asking if the Lord had forsaken them in the end of verse 13. Does that sound like a hero of the faith? God's forgetting, forgotten us. He doesn't care about us anymore. The, but the Lord empowers him. Look at verse 14. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this, thy in, in this, in this one, in God. In God's power, go, go in this, in thy might. 
And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? Listen, Gideon, you can do it. It's not about you. And we can say the same thing to us. We can affect Cyprus. But it's not about us. It's about us obeying. We talked about the Holy Spirit in Sunday school. The power comes from the Holy Spirit. That's obeying Him and following Him. We can do something great. We can be a great church that isn't determined by the size of our church or by the financial power of our church. Our greatness is determined by our obedience to the Holy Spirit and believing that God can do mighty things through us. It's our faith in Him that turns us from zeros to heroes. So the Lord tells him, then Gideon believes immediately, right? I mean, God says this to him. He's like, oh yeah, look at verse 15. And he said unto him, oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. He's being commissioned by God, and guess what he says? Oh, you can't choose me. My family's nothing. I'm the young. I don't. Is this a theme that we have in the Bible? Didn't Moses say almost the same thing? What about David? They didn't even bring him to, the, to be anointed. I mean, we, we all have these excuses. You have your excuses. I have my excuses why we don't do great things for God. He gives his excuses. We're poor. I'm the youngest. Hero material, right? Amen. He's a hero. No. We don't see him that way. But number three, the hero, Gideon. The hero, Gideon. God, uh, Gideon destroys the altar of Baal. And God says, listen, go destroy the altar of Baal. And he does it. He obeys the Lord and destroys the altar of Baal. But look at verse 27, okay? Then Gideon took ten men of his servants. He had ten servants. And did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Okay, here's this mighty hero again. Okay, guys, we're going to go destroy that, but we're not doing it during the day. Let's go sneak in there at night and do it. Does that sound like a hero to you? Even when he's obedient, <laughs> he's sneaking around, and he won't just face it. You see, the men of the city got mad because he destroyed their idol. Next day they come out, the groves are gone, the idols are gone, and they're like, who did this? And they find out it was Gideon. And they're going to kill Gideon. When his father steps in, who worshiped Baal, and says in verse 31, listen, if Baal's a god, look at verse 31. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, against his son Gideon, will he plead for Baal? Will, he, will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it's yet morning. If he be a God, let him plead for himself because one hath cast down his altar. Listen, if Baal's a real God, he should be mad because somebody cast down his altar. Let him come fight. So Gideon's there. He's like, oh man, I'm in trouble. And they get him. And his dad, this unlikely person to support him, says, no, wait a minute, guys. If Baal's a real God, let him do something. Remember Elijah? called down fire. And he says, hey, call on your God all day and all night. And I loved Elijah because I'm that sarcastic person. He says, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe you need to go wake him up. Maybe he's going on a trip. You know, he's making fun of him. You know? If he's really a God, let him do something. Because the Lord God can do something. And he called down fire for Elijah, right? And so they say, okay, we're going to see it. And so they... Uh, they changed Gideon's name in verse 32 because he destroyed Baal. Look at verse 32. Therefore, on that day, he called him Jerubbabel, saying, let Baal plead against him because he hath thrown down his altar. And guess what? Nothing happens. And Gideon's probably like, oh, no, no. But guess what? Nothing happens. And so Gideon has got to be believing God now, right? Not yet. He tests God with the fleas. Gideon is still not sure about the victory. Look at verse 36. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save, us, save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the, in, in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. Okay, God. We've got to do this part. But here, you've got to prove it to me. 
I want to flee sweat and ground dry. Sounds like a hero, right? Testing God in doubt and fear and making sure. Well, guess what happened? It was exactly like he wanted. And he said, okay, God, well, well don't get mad at me, but, but how about this time you make the fleece dry and the ground wet? And God did that. Man, we serve a long-suffering God, don't we? I mean, he's come to him, he's appeared unto him, he's told him what to do, he's commissioned him, he's, he said, you're going to win if you'll just trust me, obey me, everything will be good. And Gideon, keep, but where's all the mirror? But, what's this? Well, can you prove this? Can you prove that? This doesn't sound like a hero, does it? It doesn't sound like this Superman is going to fly and does not scare him anything. It sounds like you or me, doesn't it? That we want God to show us and prove it to us. So God says, yeah, and he proves it to him. So he says, okay. So he calls all Israel together, and 32,000 men show up to fight a battle. 30, that's a pretty good number, except they couldn't even number the things that the other, the Midianites rode on. They couldn't even number the camels of the Midianites. I mean, it's just a whole army that fills up this whole valley. And 32,000 people show up. And you know what God says to Gideon? Ah, I think that's too many. God, we're outnumbered like 10, 20, 30, 100 to 1. What do you mean it's too many? Ah. God says, listen, Gideon, if, if I let Israel defeat the Midianites, this unnumberable amount of people, with 30, they're going to think they're pretty good warriors. And the problem is, who's going to get the credit? It won't be God who did the miracle. So he says, here's what I want you to do. Tell everybody who's scared, go home. 22,000 soldiers go home, according to chapter 7, verse 2. Look at chapter 7, verse 2. And the Lord said to Gideon, to the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim the ears of the people, saying, Whomsoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned to the people 20 and 2,000. There remained 10,000. Whew, unnumberable force versus 10,000. Okay, God. That's good. No, that's still too many. What, God? Yeah, it's too many. Take him to the water, and whoever. Bends down and gets to the water, send them home. But if they take the water and they look, and we could we could speculate all day why he chose the ones that pulled the water in their face. It doesn't matter. It was God's instruction, and Gideon obeyed it. So they get this water and they pull it to their mouth, and he sends all but three hundred home. Unnumberable force versus three hundred. Well, Las Vegas is pretty good at making odds, but I don't think they would have chosen the right side here. The odds are so against Israel, there's no way they can win unless God steps in. There's only one way they're going to win, is if God steps in. Look at verses, uh, chapter 7, verse 10, 11. God speaking to Gideon again, again. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with uh, Fura, thy servant down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thine hands be strengthened. <laughs> Gideon is still afraid. He still doesn't believe God after the fleece and all that, after destroying the, the altars and, and, and that working out. He still, and God says, okay, if you're afraid, go down and listen. So he goes down and he sneaks up to the camp with his servant, and they hear the, the, uh, the enemy talking about him and saying, God's come to destroy us. Like a piece of bread roll. And they're just going to wipe us out. And Gideon's going, how did I walk up on this conversation? Because God did. Right? And he's like, I can't believe it. How about our mighty man of valor, right? He's still scared. He's still doubting. He goes down and hears them talking about how Israel's going to win. From zero to hero, and he's still doubting God. 
You know Hero's Doubt? You know Hero's Doubt? We, as people, don't think heroes should ever doubt, right? Heroes don't doubt. They're not scared. But in reality, they do. And when you start doubting what God wants you to do, understand, that's normal. Gideon did it. In fact, everyone we're going to talk about at one point or another had doubt. Everyone that we're going to talk about in this series at one point or another sinned. Everyone has doubts, and the Christian that you look at and go, man, that person's a super Christian. When they go to witness to somebody, they get butterflies in their stomach. And they doubt. What the difference is, is if you let doubt stop you. That determines whether you're going to be a zero or a hero. If you let doubt stop you. You can pray to God and ask Him to show you things, and He will, just like He did for Gideon. You can, you can ask all of these things. But at the end, you have to obey. At the end, you have to trust God. Gideon gives each person of the 300 a trumpet, a pot, and a lamp, according to verse 16. Look at verse, chapter 7, verse 16. And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps with pitch, with, uh, with the pit, within the pitchers. So, okay, here's a lamp, cover it. I mean, here, here's a fire, you know, a torch. Cover it with this pitcher and, and have a trumpet around you, okay? Um, what are we fighting with? We're going to fight a battle. Where's our sword? Where's our arrows? No, 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 I got it, I got it. Just do what I say. So he gives them and he tells them something very important for a hero in verse 17. I want you to look at verse chapter 7, verse 17. And he said unto them, look on me and do likewise. Heroes allow themselves to be watched. And they live righteous lives before God. And they allow people to watch them. And Gideon says, do what I do. Now, if you want to be a hero, you have to live righteous lives and let people see that. Because that separates the zeros. That's, that's the only difference on our behalf. Everything else is God. But we choose to live righteous lives and we let people watch. He models what to do. He lets people follow. So they get there. They surround them in the middle of the watch. They have torch covered by a lamp and a trumpet. He takes the, the, the pot up, he throws down brakes and holds a torch up, and he tells them, yell the sword of the Lord and get in and blow you trumpets. They got three companies around the Midianites. They have no swords, no arrows, no nothing, and they're going into battle in the middle of the night. They throw it down, they break it, they hold up their torch, they start yelling and playing their trumpet. And the Midianites, they're asleep. Look in verse 19 through 21. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came into the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all. And they cried, The sword of the Lord of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. The guys are standing around there. They take off the thing, hold the sword up, break it. The sword of the Lord of Gideon. They start blowing their trumpet and they don't move. These are great battle plans. You know, God always comes up with some great ones. Walk around every day, once around the city. On the seventh day, walk around seven times and yell. And what's that going to do? Okay, here's one. Break a pitcher, yell, and blow a trumpet. Hold your torch up. The people wake up in the middle of the night and start running around. There's so many people, you can't know everybody. They start fighting each other. Well, I don't recognize him. <laughs> start killing him. And Gideon and the army of 300 stand there and go, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> They've got no idea what's happening. 
Here, look at can y'all see? Hold the light this way. Let's go. And this whole army fighting each other. They're destroying each other. They're running. They're fleeing. They're going. And Gideon wins. And they're as astonished as anybody. They're like, what in the world? Look at verse 22. And 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the hosts fled to Bethshitta and Zerath and to the border of Abel Mohola unto Tabath. They go in every direction. <laughs> they're gone. And they're going, just told a light and yelled and blew a trumpet. What? What are you talking about? And Gideon's a hero and he's a judge listed in the Bible for that. What did he do? He obeyed. He believed. And he worked despite his doubt. As Christians, every day we have doubts whether we can do what God's called us to do. Can I talk to my friend? Can I, can I talk to my co-worker about Jesus? Can I... Can I really live a good life? And, you know, we're going to mess up. We have to ask for forgiveness. And, you know, sometimes we tell God, you're wrong, God. Just like Gideon did. And God's left us. He hasn't performed the miracles. But you know what? God is long-suffering to us. He loves us so much that he, want to turn, he wants to turn a bunch of zeros into a bunch of heroes. <laughs> but it's a, if you obey him and trust him. See, Gideon, there was nothing special about Gideon. We started with a guy hiding by himself with nothing, and now we have a leader of people. But he was still afraid. The difference between the zero and the hero is their obedience to God and nothing else. It has nothing to do with his ability. It has nothing to do with your ability. The same thing is in the church and each one of God's soldiers. It has nothing to do with us. It's about doing what God tells us to do and obeying Him. As followers of Christ, obedience is our weapon. We don't plan. We don't think. We just obey. And isn't that what they train soldiers to do in the military? Don't think. Don't plan. Just obey. And we can win a war. Our weapons are prayer obedience and His Word. That's our weapons. That doesn't sound like a good weapon. Neither does a pitcher of fire and a horn. And yet God with those things can do great things. God can cause walls to fall when we just walk around. God can cause waters to go back when we step down into the Red Sea. God takes care of the hard stuff Ours is the obedience. If you go back, verse 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of God. Let me tell you something. You are a mighty warrior for God if you'll let Him do the fight. If you'll obey Him. If you'll trust Him and do what He says. Are we doing that today? Are we being mighty men? Are we being heroes of the faith? Let's pray. God, as we come before You, we thank You for Your Word. We understand that it's not about us, but it's all about You. This church is not here to glorify any one of us, but to tell people we serve an awesome God and a great Savior. Lord, help us to know You and follow You. Help us to be obedient, not to make our own plans, but to ask You for plans. That we would use the weapons You've given us that don't seem like much but when used the way you teach us, they win wars. They break down the gates of hell. Lord, help us to honor you with our lives. And as a church, that we tend to do great things by obeying you. In Jesus' name.